Right. All right, so thank you all for joining me this morning for the Regional Transportation Committee meeting for July 20th, 2021. It is 8.33, we have a quorum, and um, we're holding this meeting electronically because of COVID-19, but hopefully not for much longer, or maybe forever, who knows what'll happen. <laughs> I'll call the meeting to order. <laughs> the first item on the agenda is public comment. Are there any members of the public that would care to comment on items that are not on our agenda today? If, if you would care to comment, please raise your hand at this time. You'll find the raise hand icon in the bottom of the panel, or if you've dialed in by phone, you can dial star nine. Seeing none, that takes us to um, our attachment A. You'll find the June 15th, 2021 RTC meeting summary in attachment A, and we will accept that. If you have any questions or comments about it, please contact staff. And that takes us to our action items. The first action item is the FY 2022-2023 Transportation Demand Management Services Set Aside Eligibility and Evaluation Processes. Steve Erickson, our Communications and Marketing Director, is going to take us through that. And if you're following along in your packet, you'll find it as attachment B. Steve, please take it away. Well, good morning, everyone, and, and thank you for that kind introduction. Give me just a second here and I'll share my screen. Uh, again, I'm Steve Erickson. I'm the Communications and Marketing Director at Dr. Cog, and one of the best things I get to do in that role is, is oversee our Way to Go program, which, as many of you know, is, is actually a partnership between Dr. Cog and seven transportation management associations in the region. So uh, here today to talk about uh, the TDM set aside uh, eligibility rules and, and process. Uh, and this is something that's already gone through Transportation Advisory Committee and has been recommended to this committee for approval. So let me know if you're able to see this. Um, it's not full screen. Oh, now we go. It's great. Okay. Very good. Well, thanks again. So again, just to um, um, refresh everyone, this is actually pretty much the same set aside that uh, we uh, approved a couple of years ago in our first run through uh, you know, this particular uh, tip set aside. So, but to put it in the context of some of the other uh, tip set asides, um, if you look at the, the bottom box here, really that transportation demand management services, um, you'll see in orange, this particular set aside for transportation demand management, non-infrastructure projects at $1.8 million. And that's over the course of, of four years. So there is one correction on this slide and I really just caught it this morning and I let Ron Papsdorf know about it. Uh, it's not really consequential necessarily to what we're discussing today, but where you see uh, funding for the Dr. Cog Way to Go program at $8 million, that really should be $8.8 .8 million. So if you, if you do the math, uh, the number uh, for all of transportation demand management services uh, is correct there, but I, I did want to point out that I discovered that typo this morning. Uh, the other set asides uh, for, for the tip include uh, RTO operations and technology, air quality improvements, and human service transportation. So the purpose of this particular set aside is really to support marketing, outreach, and research projects to reduce uh, single occupant vehicle travel. So it really is very complementary to the Way to Go program. Uh, our goals are to reduce travel or traffic congestion, improve air quality. Uh, ultimately, we, we look for opportunities to pilot new approaches to transportation demand management uh, to support healthy and active choices. Many of you know uh, about the Way to Go program uh, in part because of, of Bike to Work Day. Um, the second largest event of its kind in the country that, that we organize and, and execute every year. That's now planned. Here's a shameless plug. That's now planned for September 22nd this year. So I hope to see you all out there. Uh, we also are, are really cognizant of improving awareness and access to mobility options for people of all ages, incomes, and abilities. So for this two-year uh, call for projects, we have $900,000 available. Again, half of that 1.8 million for this 2022-2023 call. Uh, in order to be eligible, uh, you have to be um, eligible, I guess, to receive uh, federal transportation funds. So oftentimes, um, if, if you're not a local government enter, entity, you're at least partnering with a local government entity on these, on these particular projects. 
Uh, pro uh, project sponsors must be in good standing with the state of Colorado. Uh, all scopes of work must adhere to STBG program guidance and project sponsors have to pledge local match and, and that is 17.21%. Uh, uh, so as we have in the past, we'll be using a, a two-step process here. Uh, first step would be a letter of intent and that's really sort of conceptual and then the formal application process. Uh, this uh, snaky uh, <laughs> uh, diagram will sort of walk you through uh, maybe drilling down one level. We'll initially uh, be conducting uh, a mandatory uh, TDM service application workshop, and we'll probably hope to do that in the next uh, few weeks towards the end of August. At that point, we're asking uh, potential project sponsors to identify those concepts and, and even to have discussions with Dr. Cog's staff. From there, they'll submit that letter of intent, as I described sort of that first big step, and then we'll have an opportunity even at that stage to have further discussions with project sponsors, uh, you know, and, and hopefully give them some guidance that will turn into ultimately what would be that full application. Uh, from there, we will actually do the, the formal call. We'll invite people to apply for this uh, and then go through a review process that I'll get to in just a minute uh, where uh, we'll, with with uh, other stakeholders come up with a list of recommended projects that we'll bring back before the committees and ultimately recommend uh, to the board of directors for approval. So Dr. Cog uh, will stand up a review panel and it will consist of both internal and external stakeholders. So the internal stakeholders uh, will be from communications and marketing. Typically we'll have someone from area agency on aging our transportation planning and operations division, as well as uh, regional planning and development. The external stakeholders uh, will come from a number of organizations and stakeholders in the region. We always have uh, representation from Federal Highways, uh, from Colorado Department of Transportation or CDOT. Uh, CDPHE is typically involved and then we'll uh, invite some additional stakeholders that, that sort of know the TDM space pretty well. So Regional Air Quality Council, uh, RTD, or other TDM professionals in the region. So each member of the panel will review the initial applications and assign points according to the criteria. And this was included in the packet um, in, in section A. Uh, in addition to uh, the review panel scoring, Dr. Cox staff uh, will score on some sort of data-driven criteria, and I'll give you a little more information on that in just a second. Uh, but as I've described them, the panel will convene, uh, discuss those applications, uh, hopefully reach consensus, and, and bring that recommended list of projects before the committees and, and the board. So the review panel scoring, I just wanted to drill down a little bit and sort of let you know the kinds of things that we're uh, really looking at uh, in these applications. So uh, as you might guess, uh, VMT is, is kind of king. Uh, and, you know, so, uh, you know, a project that scores really, really well in terms of VMT reduction is, is likely uh, gonna, going to be given strong consideration for funding. But we also are looking at level of innovation and uniqueness, uh, replicability, if this is successful in a particular uh, part of the region, can, can it maybe, maybe be replicated uh, in other areas, access, uh, funding effectiveness, and then project and applicant readiness, as well as timing or synergy. So those are the review panel uh, scoring criteria. And again, more detail in the, in the uh, attachment that was part of the packet. And then the Dr. Cobb data-driven scoring, which is 25% of the total, looks at things like short trip opportunity potential, obviously important for biking and walking, uh, looks at EJ areas uh, and, and whether or not a project uh, is uh, a part of a Dr. Cobb designated urban center. Uh, we look at uh, sort of the strength of financial partners that, that might be involved as well as local match. And really the only deciding thing on local match is whether it's uh, cash or in kind, uh, a few more points for, for cash match. So with that, I'm happy to take uh, any questions uh, and, and there's a motion before you.
Thank you very much. That was a great presentation this morning. Are there comments, questions, or motions from members of the RTC? You can raise your hand by clicking the icon in the bottom of the panel. All right, I'm not seeing, oh, Director Flynn, thank you so much. Saves the day. I, I was struggling to look for the raised hand while I was on the other screen and it doesn't work that way, does it? No, it doesn't. Uh, does <laughs> the, uh, are all applicants invited to apply? I was curious when we got to that, that little, looks like the game of uh, shoots and ladders. Uh, step five, are, are all the applicants invited to apply or do we use the process to uh, maybe winnow or uh, uh, slim down the, the field? Marketing Steve. Director Erickson? Yes, that's, that's a great uh, question, Director Flynn. So really the purpose of that of that letter of intent and, and sort of, you know, the beginnings of that are to get a concept to a place where we would then invite an applicant to apply. So we would have had um, opportunity to review letter of intent, which is sort of, you know, conceptual uh, and then talk about specifically uh, any recommendations there might be to get this to where it's a project that really fits neatly within this particular call. And so, so not every uh, organization that would submit a letter of intent would necessarily make it through to getting that application to apply. But, you know, thinking of, of what I saw a couple of years ago, I would say it was probably, you know, 90% due. The, the only right. case typically where they would be winnowed out would be, you know, where we've just determined it's not really a fit for this particular call. Right. Okay. Thank you. That's, that's what I was hoping would be the answer. Appreciate it. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Director Flynn. Director Peck? Thank you. Um, thank you for this presentation. Also, I, I, it's been very helpful. My question is, and I apologize if you said this during your presentation, when we're talking about marketing and outreach, is this uh, effort only toward regional projects or it, can it be used for local projects as well? Yeah, no, it, uh, great, great question again, Director Peck. And it, it, it can be used for, for local projects as well. And again, what we're looking at, um, I mean, part of the exercise I think we, you know, we go through is if it's, if it's a, a local project, let's, let's just say within one jurisdiction is we are looking um, overall at, at kind of regional benefits. So in terms of you know, things like where it could be scored on DMT reduction, uh, that would really be the only only consideration. You know, a local smaller project might not generate as much uh, potential DMP reduction, but uh, definitely local projects are welcome. As long as it connects to a regional VMT or um, regional enhancement in some form or other, is that? Am yeah. I interpreting that correct? I, I, I would say, uh, Director Peck, it doesn't necessarily have to, you know, have any regional connection. I mean, it, uh, other than any jurisdiction, uh, any local project needs to be within our region, but we had, I'm just thinking of, of one example uh, from this current cycle, um, a town of, of, of Littleton has a TDM set aside project, which really works very closely alongside our school pool program and safe routes to school. And so, but it's, you know, that project in terms of the geographic definition is, is really all within Littleton, if that's okay. okay. Yeah. Great, great answer, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Director Peck. Uh, I have a question, um, Director Erickson for you. So it, traditionally I think of these projects as like the TMA projects, like the way to go projects to get the word out, to improve carpooling, to improve all of, to reduce VMT. But I wonder, um, can you talk a little bit about if our regional transportation district would be eligible for our funds? I just know with COVID-19, it has impacted ridership significantly. And I wonder um, almost every day how we're going to restore ridership and how we're going to um, get people back out there feeling comfortable taking the bus and train to work or to their friend's house or to their grandma's house. Um, so can you tell me if they're eligible and what, what kind of outreach we've done with RTD around this? Yeah, I would say, uh, and I, I might look to, to Ron or Doug to help answer this. It's a great question, uh, Director and, and Chair Stolzman. Uh, I don't know that they uh, are specifically uh, precluded from, you know, from applying. They have typically been uh, a part of the, the review panel. So that, you know, that 
probably would not allow this, but Ron, I, I see your hand raised in terms of this STBG let's, funding and how it's defined. Let's uh, turn over to Ron, uh, Director Papstorff. Hi everybody, Ron Papstorff, Director of Transportation Planning and Operations at Dr. Cog. Um, RTD would be an eligible recipient of funds so they certainly could apply, uh, just whatever, whatever they applied for would have to be an eligible project type under the, under the TDM services program. But RTD certainly is an eligible um, recipient of the funds and an eligible applicant. Obviously, with, as, as Steve alluded to, with them having a member on the review panel, we'd probably want to make sure that there was some separation there. But you know, we, we trust all of our partners to be able to be objective when they're participating. We do that during our normal TIP process as well. We have local representatives, local agency representatives participating in uh, review panels. And we, we trust all of our partners to sort of look at the whole set of applications objectively. Thank you very much. And I'm not seeing any other hands this morning. So if there are no other comments or questions, if we could get a motion on the table and uh, Director Shaw, good morning. Good morning, thank you. Uh, I will make the motion. I move to approve or to recommend to the Dr. Cog Board of Directors, the eligibility rules and evaluation process for selecting non-infrastructure marketing, outreach, and research projects to be funded through the Transportation mm -hmm. Demand Manage Management Services set aside of the fiscal years 2020 through 2023 trans trans Transportation Improvement Program. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a second? Director Peck. I second that. Thank you. Any further discussion of the motion? All right, seeing none, all those in favor, please unmute and say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, the motion carries. And that takes us to our next agenda item this morning, which is the FY 2022-2023 Unified Planning Work Program for the Denver region. <laughs> You'll find it in attachment C, Josh Schwenk, Assistant Planner is gonna take us through this. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I believe you should be seeing my presentation now. Is that correct? I'm just waiting for it to go full screen, but we can see the there. not full screen version. Now we can see it. Perfect, thank you so much. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, RTC members may recall at your April meeting, I presented a informational update on the development of the UPWP. So happy to bring a completed draft document to you this morning. Um, so just quickly uh, going through kind of the background of what the document is, uh, the Unified Planning Work Program is a list of all of the multimodal transportation planning activities uh, expected to be conducted within our region over a two year period. This document covers federal fiscal years 2022 to 23. Uh, this is a federally required product that we produce in our role as the MPO for the Denver region. Um, so there are some uh, FHWA and FTA guidelines that we follow in delivering it, um, but it's also used internally uh, to schedule and budget staff time and resources uh, towards the tasks and activities that we're conducting. <clears throat> so as we uh, develop the document, we keep in mind certain things. So there are uh, certain federally required products that we must include. So obviously the production of our RTP and TIP and the air quality conformity modeling that goes into the projects included in those documents. Uh, there are also uh, more general federal transportation planning factors. There are 10 of these um, in the beginning of the document itself. Uh, all 10 are listed as well as which activities directly address each of the 10 factors. Um, and then of course, at the regional level, we keep in mind our Metro Vision and Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plans, which really set out uh, the vision for our region, our objectives and goals for where we wanna be going. And we wanna make sure that the planning tasks that we are doing at Dr. Cog are helping us to advance those objectives. So within this specific document, uh, the first section that I'll touch on is our accomplishments section. It's kind of where we pat ourselves on our back, but uh, we go over everything that we've uh, been able to complete over the period of the previous UPWP, in this case, 2020 to 2021. I've just pulled out a few examples on this slide, but as you can see, you know, these are some of 
are very large um, and in some cases pretty pretty innovative products that we're very proud of. Um, a lot of work went into these. There was a lot of engagement in a in a period that was difficult to engage with the public. So I think we're we're pretty proud of these, and we want to make sure that we're sharing these with all of you and with the public that uh, these are products that we've been able to complete to continue moving the region forward over this time period. Once you, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, once you get into kind of the main section of the document, which is the list of tasks and activities itself, uh, this is a similar structure to previous documents. So there are seven major objectives that are listed. Within each objective then are a list of activities, which are sort of general uh, topic areas. And then within each activity are bullet point lists of tasks, as well as any specific uh, discrete deliverables that will be produced. So these are the seven objectives and uh, kind of general description of each one. I'm not going to go through all of them. Uh, I'll just point out that they are uh, similar to what you've seen in the past. There has been some general uh, rewording as well as some shifting of activities between objectives. But in general, these are very, very similar to what you've seen in the past. So it should be familiar if you viewed this document before. Uh, just some real quick highlights. And again, this is by no means all of the tasks included in the document, but just wanted to pull out a few that may be of interest. So obviously, the uh, call for projects and the development of the new 24 to 27 tip will fall within this time period. Um, and then a lot of activities around implementing the new 2050 MVRTP. Um, and related to that are some updates and implementation around some of our other planning documents in the region. So we're looking at potential updates to our high injury network uh, that's included in the Taking Action on Regional Vision Zero plan as new crash data comes out, as well as the continued activities of our Regional Vision Zero working group. Um, continued implementation activities of our active transportation plan, including implementing the new Complete Streets Toolkit that will be coming out, um, and then continued activities around Mobility Choice Blueprint. So that's really the activities of the Advanced Mobility Partnership, the Micromobility Working Group, things like that. Um, additionally, we have a couple new uh, programs that we're proposing in the document. Uh, these include some uh, corridor and community-based transportation planning, which would be Dr. Cog-led. Um, so stay tuned for more information on that over the next couple of months, but that should be coming out soon. Um, and then the development of some of the data products that we know a lot of local agencies rely upon, uh, including the regional aerial photography project, land cover and planimetric projects. So in front of you is a proposed motion for your consideration. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions that there might be. Thank you. Would anyone like to make a motion to frame our discussion this morning? Not seeing any hands. Director Peck. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, for this presentation. As we move forward, um, I am going to keep in mind that we are in a, a very special time frame for funding for rail and the multimodal uh, description, I guess I would say, through CDOT um, includes rail, which uh, I was part of a team that actually helped get that into the multimodal uh, description of what was multimodal. So as we talk about future transit projects, whether we can uh, amend this uh, draft or we can add to it, I am just gonna bring forward just FYI that we fund or put in the transportation planning, uh, working with the federal government, with the RTD, with uh, CDOT, that we get an alignment to the I-25 corridor, that front range passenger rail and that Dr. Cog keep in its vision that that is something that we should partner with and if it takes amending this or adding to it with the new categories, I guess, that are coming up, I, I just wanna make that, to put that on the radar. So thank, thank you. Thank you, Director Peck. Director Flynn. Uh, thank you, Chair Solzman. I uh, 
raised my hand to make the motion so that it would be on the table for discussion. Thank so you. may I move to recommend uh, to the board the draft fiscal year 22-23 unified planning work program or UPWOOP. Thank you, Director Flynn. Is there a second? This is Director Kate Williams. I can second that. Thank you, Director Williams. And then we can continue discussion on the motion. Director Papsdorf. Thank you, Chair Stolzman. I just, I wanted to uh, address Director Peck's um, comment. Um, I, I think it's, a, it's, an import, it's an important issue and I don't believe there is an amendment to the Unified Planning Work Program necessary to accommodate that. One of, one of our key objectives in the UPWP is about um, planning coordination uh, work uh, with all of our partners and um, as, as well as um, public, uh, public transportation planning or transit planning. So we're well aware of sort of those initiatives around rail and um, we have um, uh, identified the opportunity to work with our partners around the full spectrum of, of transit planning and transit issues throughout the region, including rail. So I, I believe it's already covered within the UPWP, not the UPWOP. <laughs> Thank you, Director Peck. Uh, actually, I just want to apologize in, in my passion for this subject, I jumped the queue and I should have waited for the motion to be made to open the discussion. So you're thanks. just fine. No, no problem at all, Director Peck. We have kind of a relaxed format here. And as long as we keep moving, we'll be just fine. Okay, thank you. Any other discussion um, on this topic this morning? All right, we have a motion in front of us to approve the EPWA. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, the motion carries. That takes us to our informational briefings. Todd Cottrell, our senior transportation planner is gonna take us through the next briefing. It's attachment D in your packet. It's the 2020 to 2023 transportation improvement program dual model process and the policy development process schedule. Todd, good morning. All Thanks right, good morning. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. And good morning, everyone. Um, so the reason for this morning's presentation is essentially twofold. Um, as Josh just previously mentioned uh, in his presentation, we have started the development of the 24 to 27 tip. And typically whenever I'm in front of you, it's always tip related. And we seem to either be updating a current tip or starting the development of a new one. So uh, back in April, we did kick off discussions with our transportation advisory committee and have you know, started those discussions on potential policy changes within the policy document. So I'll, I'll present a schedule to you a, bit, a little bit later in the presentation. Uh, but first of all, I, I wanted to make sure everyone was sort of on the same page with our, new, our newest process, uh, which we kicked off with the 20 to 23 tip, uh, which now we call the dual model process. Oops, good. There we go. Um, so, as I mentioned, this did start with a 20 to 23 tip cycle um, from approximately 2015 to 2018. Over those four years, we held, uh, you know, over 140 meetings, met both on a technical and policy level to really develop this new process, which was quite a major shift in the way that Dr. Kage has conducted the transportation improvement program. Uh, perhaps the best way to describe this on a very high level is centralized versus decentralized. And I think by centralized, we really sort of mean where um, in the past, again, pre-20 to 23 tip, uh, Dr. Cog would issue a call for projects. Um, that call for projects, um, the applications would come back to Dr. Cog's staff to score. Um, staff would make a recommendation to all the committees and eventually the board on which projects um, we would recommend to be funded. In this decentralized process, we've sort of, in some aspects, removed a, a little bit of the Dr. Cog staff role and pushed that out to the actual member governments and the ones who are, are applying for projects and are assisting, getting their assistance in making those recommendations. And I'll describe that as we sort of go through this process. Um, but the main essence of the foundational elements of this dual model are essentially containing the four elements that you see on the screen. Um, the set-asides, uh, the transportation forums, uh, the funding splits, which we really are calling the regional and sub-regional share 
And of course, the tip book is serious. So the remaining three we'll discuss in a little bit more detail as we go through the presentation. But the tips set aside uh, is something that has been as part of part of the tip process, you know, over the last 20 to 30 years. Uh, and actually, we'll reference um, Steve's TDM presentation, the first presentation you saw this morning, and it really did lay out um, the existing set asides that we do have within the TIP process. And again, those are are typically smaller in nature and more specialized. And you know, I, uh, with the exception of a couple, um, most have their own individual call for projects, and they're able to set their own um, policy on which eligibility criteria. Uh, so first item to discuss is the, the transportation forums. And again, this is really a, a, it was a brand new process where um, a forum is defined as an individual county and all the incorporated areas within. So each Dr. Cog member um, had a vote as part of being on a forum. Um, these forums were also open to the public um, and they really provided a, a life beyond the TIP process. So yes, they were started as part of the 20 to 23 TIP process, but throughout the life of these forums to date, um, we've really used these to introduce and have discussions on other Dr. Cog products, including the RTP, um, Vision Zero. Um, but in addition to only the Dr. Cog uh, products, it also has, also has been used by CDOT and RTD um, to provide outreach. Um, and then with a few, there's also been um, additional local issues that have been discussed, like for example, um, uh, maybe a, a county transportation plan. So again, these forums are just a, a way for each member to um, you know, get in touch with the local members in their geographic area. So the regional share process, um, in the 20 to 23 process, uh, this contained 20% of the available funding after the set-asides were taken off the top. And the regional share goal was really to select a limited number of regional and high priority projects. So really to accomplish this, um, there were project eligibility limits placed within this call. Uh, this included funding requests, um, a minimum match of 50%, and of course, um, you know, project type and project locations were, were very specific for this call. Um, for this call, it did operate somewhat similar to how Dr. Cog did do it pre-20 to 23 tip. Um, Dr. Cog did score these projects, though we did introduce a new element for a project review panel in which the project review panel did review Dr. Cog's store, scores, and they were the ones who actually made the recommendations back to the Dr. Cog committees and the board um, for approval. For the sub-regional share, um, this contained the remaining 80% or the bulk of the funding. Um, and then this funding was then further targeted to each individual forum using a formula um, that looked at population, employment, and VMT. Its goal was really to implement um, MetroVision and the regional transportation plan, but also you know, being able to interject local values into the process, um, knowing that one form and community might operate and be at a different development level than perhaps another. Uh, for the sub-regional share, uh, we really did open up the eligibility, eligibility rules and simply said, you know, if a project is federally eligible, it was allowable, um, with a few, a few exceptions of uh, it needed to be on the allowable roadway system. Um, for the sub regional share, the actual forums did score their own projects, um, had those discussions, um, made the review, and ultimately made a recommendation on which projects to uh, recommend for funding back to Dr. Cog committees and the board. Another element of the process was the tip focus areas. Um, there was three focus areas in the previous tip, including mobility for vulnerable populations, um, reliability, and safety and security. Uh, these focus areas were really set to guide the investments that Dr. Cog made, uh, though I think it's important to point out at this time that um, the focus areas were not a project eligibility component simply meaning you did not have to meet one or all three of these um, tip focus areas to be eligible to submit and be funded. 
Uh, one last thing I did want to mention, um, just because, again, there was such a drastic change. Um, I think this is certainly one of those. Uh, the application was actually sort of reworked and changed from, um, you know, where in the past it was really quantitative and now it is more qualitative, where we're simply asking, you know, why is this project important versus trying to look at the past and use a 100 point scale. Um, the, the qualitative nature of the application, we were able to change the scoring system to sort of a high, medium, low um, system where we weren't necessarily looking at a, a difference or if project A was project, project A was better than project B because it scored two or three more points. Um, also within this process, we did remove the requirements to submit within certain project types. So in the past, you were sort of pigeonholed and there were certain questions pertaining to the different project types. We now have removed that and simply said, you can submit any project type you want. We're not going to limit you within certain project types. So finally, um, as we kind of move through the process, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have now started the development of the 24 to 27 tip cycle. Um, and back in April, we did kick off discussions with the Transportation Advisory Committee. Um, so the top half of the screen sort of outlines the, the development schedule for the TIP policy document. And the TIP policy document simply outlines how Dr. Cog and all the other partners conduct this call for projects and what are the rules in certain circumstances. Um, so as you can see, there's a, there are quite a bit of elements that we are working through. Uh, we are looking for um, board adoption of the policy document in January of 22. Um, following that schedule, we can kind of move to the bottom half where um, I guess it's the yellow slash orange lines, depending on your screen, on your screen outlines um, the different steps within the process. So very soon um, after the policy document is adopted, we can move right into the regional share call for projects in February and March of 22. Um, kind of following down that line. Um, looking for the regional share recommendation and action in approximately June. Then shortly after we can kick off the regional or the sub-regional share call for projects and hold that throughout the months of, uh, you know, late June through August. Um, this schedule sort of takes us down to a path where we're looking for the 24 to 27 tip to be adopted in April of 23. Uh, so it, it is a large process. Um, I think the typical process pre-dual model used to take approximately 18 months. Uh, we've now expanded that, expanded that out to approximately two years. Um, so it does involve a lot of time, um, but we are looking to really touch base with everyone and making sure that we are selecting you know, the best projects for the region. So with that, uh, be happy to take any comments or questions questions you may have. And um, I hope that helped bringing everyone up to speed. Thank you, Mr. Cottrell. <laughs> Director Flynn, we'll start us off with questions. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Todd, I find it a little confusing that, uh, that it is not a project eligibility component to have the uh, uh, projects be uh, tied to one of our focus areas. If we have these three focus areas, why would we not include that as a requirement? Yeah, and that's a very good question. And I believe that is certainly a topic that we can address as we have those discussions um, coming up, not only on a technical level, but certainly uh, at a policy level. Um, I honestly don't recall exactly why that was not made a project eligibility component in the previous tip. Uh, again, like I mentioned, we can certainly address that sort of as we have those discussions coming up um, this summer. Sure, Ms. I'd, like, I'd like to speak, I'm sorry, go ahead. Sorry, Director Flynn, I just, it looks like um, Director Papsdorf wanted to add to that response. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, thank you. I, 
we'll say we're having a lot of conversations with the transportation advisory committee, uh, kind of with your with your staffs, uh, staff representatives around these issues. And I suspect this this is an area that we will certainly revisit and and think through. Also, Director Flynn at the um, board workshop at the end of August, we will be having a conversation with the board about sort of how we how we um, incorporate focus areas or other priority areas into this upcoming tip cycle. So there's definitely opportunities over the next several months to to revisit this issue um, and and kind of figure out how we tie in uh, particular priorities uh, to steer our investments in the next tip cycle. And thank you. If, if we have focus areas, not that I would expect this as a, as a reasonable possibility, but but certainly theoretically possible that none of the submissions would be in our focus areas. I doubt that that would ever happen, but I think the process ought to account for uh, if a project uh, does not uh, consist of any of those three focus areas or, or account for any of them, maybe the application process could ask for an explanation, why not? Why should this why should this go forward if it's not in one of our focus areas? It's either either these three focuses foci are important to us or they're not, right? So thank you. Thank you, Director Flynn. And I'm not seeing any other hands, but I'll just ask a question while folks are thinking about their questions. Uh, so I wonder, you know, we've heard a lot about this infrastructure package that may or may not be passed at the federal level. Um, and so we have a tip waiting list, but it is running thin. And I recently heard at the State Transportation um, Advisory Committee meeting that the CDOT project list is running thin on shovel-ready projects. So if we do get a large additional tranche of money before this process is through, um, would we do an interim additional call for projects or would we accelerate this process or some other idea? Um. I guess the first thing to mention is we will bring to the RTC in, in September um, a list of projects to recommend to adding to the wait list. So as part of the board's August, or I'm sorry, as part of the board's April uh, action, we did issue a call for projects um, just to add and, and bulk up the existing wait list. Um, so the project review panel just met uh, yesterday, in fact, to make a recommendation, and we'll be, we'll be bringing that first to the August TAC. Um, so that will assist a little bit. Um, in terms of if additional funding does come, which we sort of expect, but we're not exactly sure, um, if that does happen, we obviously will go through the waiting list process first. Um, and then I think the decisions after that really depend on the amount of funds that we would receive and how many projects are still remaining that cannot move forward based on that waiting list process. So um, a little unsure at this point, and again, only based on there's a lot of variables that we're not sure yet right now. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And sorry to make you speculate so early on. It's just, I'm sure <laughs> no we'll have more questions about this. <laughs> Director Dale. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. It seems to me that in the last tip, we had subregions that got together and made recommendations for what you might call a regional uh, improvement that weren't included in the regional. And maybe I'm not remembering right, but to me, that's worth a mention because I thought that that effort, I guess it was up north that one of the highways that we uh, that we ended up recommending uh, improvements on that went across regions was that happened. So maybe it's uh, an understood thing, but I thought that was really uh, notable that uh, subregions had cooperated on something. And just my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's a great thing to remind everybody on the collaboration around this. Thank you, Director Dale. Not seeing any other hands on this topic, and so that'll bring us to our um, that'll bring us through that topic today. Thank you, everyone. And it takes us to our administrative items. I wonder if there are any member comments or other matters by any members. And um, Commissioner Stanton, do you want to make your comment? 
just so oh, everybody... Yes, I do. Thanks, Chair Stoltzman. I just wanted to give everyone an update. The Transportation Commission last week approved opening up greenhouse gas rulemaking, and there's going to be uh, multiple opportunities for public comment. Um, it might be good uh, to pass along that website that I put in the chat to any stakeholders. And it's important to note that people do not have to have quote status. Uh, people can make comments. So this is an open process. It's gonna be going on for a while. There's about a 15 page memo dated 13 July, which is draft. And uh, Teresa Takushi and uh, Kay Kelly and others in the team are working on this. So wanted to give you all a heads up right now. Thank you. Thank you. And Executive Director Rex. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I just, um, just to elaborate a little more on uh, Director Stanton's um, comments with regards to the upcoming greenhouse gas emission rule. Thank you, sir, very much for bringing that up. Um, the Dr. Cog board will be having uh, plenty of conversations about this in future meetings, beginning with the, our August um, board work session. We'll be providing kind of a 30,000 foot level uh, conversation for, um, for the board's um, uh, edification. And then at our August board meeting, we hope that you know the proposed rule will have the language and then we'll, we're hoping to do a deeper dive into that so that we can brief the board as much as possible and provide staff any direction. So thank you, sir, very much. Appreciate you raising it. Thank you both. Director Dale? Yeah, I, yes, Madam Chair, thank you. Yeah, you know, our congressman for the three around our, re, our uh, mop asked for input for pork barrel or whatever you want to call them. It's, to, to me, it's an important thing. And so those submissions by cities and counties to our uh, congressman people really will form a basis for some of the programs we might get if we even get more money for infrastructure. So I'm hopeful there'll be agreement on this and that cities and counties that applied will get some of the projects they applied for. And I feel pretty excited about it. I think that there'll be, there have been announcements or will be on which projects the, the Congressman Perlmutter Crow and to get have added to their lists and I think that's going to be real positive that it goes through. Thank you. Thank you, Director Dale. Anyone else have member comments? Director Shaw. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, uh, Director Dale brings up a very good point. Is there any uh, crossover between um, our list and those things that were submitted to either the governor or Congressman Perlmutter, I, uh, or maybe I think Senator Hickenlooper as well had a, a call. So um, it, it would be nice if we could all get things into one bucket and look at them to see if there is any um, benefit to consolidating certain ones in certain areas. Thank you, Director Shaw. Director Papstorf. Thank you, Chair Schultzman. Just um, to uh, address um, Director Dale and Director Shaw's comments about congressionally directed funding, um, there is a great deal of uncertainty about whether there will actually be congressionally directed funding. There um, certainly have been, there are efforts happening in the House of Representatives um, the House passed transportation reauthorization bill um, does include a list of congressionally directed um, projects. Uh, it's still uncertain about whether the um, ultimate reauthorization bill that has to, has to pass both the House and the Senate will actually include um, earmarked projects or congressionally directed um, funds to projects. We're watching that. We've been communicating with congressional offices, both in the House and the Senate, um, when they've, they've asked us about projects, consistency with our, trans, with our regional transportation plan, um, whether or not projects could easily uh, be added to the transportation improvement program if they, if they are, if they do receive um, congressionally directed funding and whether they could be completed. So we've been coordinating with congressional offices 
Uh, they've been great to work with. They've been reaching out to us, asking us for um, input so that we are, Director Shaw, coordinating those, those issues. Um, and I, I guess I'll leave it at that if there, unless there are other questions about that. Thank you, sir. Seeing no other comments, our next meeting is August 17th and we are adjourned. I, oh, I'm sorry, we're not adjourned yet. Director Dale had one more comment. Sorry well, about the, rushing. The comment is, I, I failed to mention Congressman the Goose, but I, I really have positive feelings about this because with every one of the congressmen and senators being able to put in earmarks, I think there's real collaboration and bipartisan support. So I really think this is gonna happen. So uh, I'm more optimist, optimistic on this than I've been in a long time. So just to make me 30 seconds longer, I had to say that. Thank you. Thank you, um, Director Dale. And optimism is always appreciated. So thank you. And as I said, next meeting's August 17th, the market calendars and we're adjourned. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks everyone. Safe, have a great day.